Welcome to the History Guy Podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories of lesser-known historical events told by Lance Geiger, also known as the History Guy on YouTube. I'm Josh, your host, a writer for the channel and eldest son of the History Guy. We tell all kinds of stories about history, from the modern era to the ancient past, so you never know what we're going to talk about next. One thing you can be sure of, it is history that deserves to be remembered. We at The History Guy are also excited to announce a new way to interact with the team and The History Guy himself at Locals.com. Join The History Guy Guild for your one-stop location to chat with other history fans, get updates on the team, and more. You can join for free or pay as little as $5 a month to get access to live chats with The History Guy, looks behind the scenes, early access to ad-free videos, and more. Find us at thehistoryguyguild.locals.com. We look forward to seeing you there. On today's episode, we're talking about the Eastern Front of World War II. First, the History Guy talks about one of the first battles of Operation Barbarossa, the heroic Soviet defense of Brest Fortress. Then he tells the story of the famous Night Witches, the Soviet women who terrorized German troops from the air. Finally, the History Guy tells the story of one of the most important battles of the war, the Battle for Moscow, and of Panaflov's 28 Guardsmen. Without further ado, let me introduce... The History Guy. It's understandable that people tend to focus on the history that most matches their experience, and yet it still surprises me how much we here in the West tend to focus on the American and British experience in the Second World War and how little we seem to understand about the war in the East. But to give an idea of the contrast between the two, to the end of 1944, nearly eight times as many German soldiers have been killed on the Eastern Front as had been killed on the Western Front. The Western Allies, excluding China, suffered about 1.2 million military casualties during the Second World War. The Soviet Union suffered between 8 and 12 million military casualties during the Second World War. In June, we in America tend to focus on the anniversary of June 6, the anniversary of D-Day, the largest amphibious invasion in history. But we talk much less about another anniversary, June 22nd, the anniversary of the largest invasion of any kind in human history. The defense of Brest Fortress on the opening days of Operation Barbarossa, the German invasion of the Soviet Union in June of 1941, is history that deserves to be remembered. Historians have described many reasons for Hitler's decision to invade the Soviet Union in 1941. Those can be a matter of dispute, but most frankly conclude that conflict between the two was inevitable. Hitler seems to have come to that conclusion by at least the middle of 1940, when General Erich Marx was tasked with developing a plan for the invasion of the Soviet Union, officially called Operation Draft East, but more commonly called the Marx Plan. The Marx Plan advocated for the occupation of what it called the AA Line, that is the occupation of a line going from the city of Arkhangelsk on the White Sea in northern Russia to the city of Ostrakhan on the Caspian Sea. The line was thought to be defensible and would so deprive the Soviet Union of resources that they would cease to be a military threat. The plan suggested that the line could be reached in a quick military campaign that would be achieved before winter set in. That confidence was likely derived from poor assessments of Soviet military readiness based on the loss of officers in Stalin's purges, and what was seen to be a poor performance by the Soviets against Finland in the Winter War in 1939 and 40. The rapid German victory over France in 1940 further bolstered German confidence. Hitler decided to name the operationalization of the Marx Plan Operation Barbarossa after 12th century Holy Roman Emperor Frederick Barbarossa. The plan was so confident that it didn't even include the distribution of winter gear or the winterization of vehicles because it assumed that all the objectives would be met before the advent of winter. The attack was originally planned to occur May 15, 1941. The sheer scale of the invasion was nearly beyond comprehension. Some 180 Axis divisions, including over 6,000 armored vehicles, nearly a million horses, and 65% of the German Air Force, approximately 3.8 million personnel, were scheduled to attack along a front nearly 2,000 miles long. But the army that they were facing was also massive. In June of 1941, the Soviet Union had nearly 6 million troops under arms and were mobilizing a reserve of some 14 million. They had more than 25,000 tanks, 100,000 pieces of artillery, and 18,000 warplanes, the largest air force in the world. It is often asserted that the Red Army was unprepared for the German attack, despite warnings from British, American, and even Stalin's own intelligence sources. That is only partially true. The Soviet Union had undertaken both a defense plan and a mobilization plan. 
But Stalin seems to have been convinced that Hitler would not attack only two years after having signed a non-aggression pact, and Soviet forces were still preparing when the attack first came. They faced many obstacles of organization and supply, lacked adequate transport, and while they had some of the most advanced armor in the world at the time, most of their armored forces were outdated, poorly supplied and equipped, and their crews poorly trained. And while the Red Army was slowly preparing for the eventuality of German attack that they thought likely, Stalin was not keen to provoke Hitler. Records from Soviet archives indicate that the Soviet high command underestimated the German threat and ignored information about the upcoming invasion. While they were straight to their border at the time, they were reticent to bring their troops to full combat readiness for fear that that would provoke the Germans into an attack that it turns out was already imminent. The date of the attack was moved from May to June. There is some debate why the attack was delayed, maybe because a coup in Yugoslavia had necessitated a German intervention, or maybe because an unusually wet winter meant that rivers were still swollen in May. But the attack commenced at 3.15 a.m. on June 22nd without a formal declaration of war. Reich Minister of Propaganda Joseph Goebbels announced the attack to the German people on the radio, portraying it as a European crusade against Bolshevism. The Axis attack was divided roughly into three commands, Army Groups North, Center, and South. Army Group Center's initial strategic goal was to defeat the Soviet armies in Belarus, between Lithuania and Latvia in the north, and the Ukraine to the south, and occupy the city of Smolensk along the Dnieper River. The ancient city of Brest lies at the border between Poland and Belarus, at the confluence of the Mukiewicz River into the Bulk River. The confluence of rivers was a strategic point, and fortifications have been built there as early as the 10th century. Between 1830 and 1842, the former medieval castle was replaced by a modern fortification, covering an area of nearly four square kilometers. Brest Fortress was part of the fortress strategy of Tsar Nicholas II, and was intended to protect the western periphery of the Russian Empire. It was an impressive fortification, with a central citadel linked to outlying fortifications built on artificial islands. The walls of the citadel were some two meters thick. The fortress had put up a brief but stout defense during the German invasion of Poland in 1939. Having captured the fortress and city, the Germans then handed over the city to the Soviets under the terms of the 1939 Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, the secret pact that had defined the boundaries of Soviet and German spheres of influence as part of the German-Soviet non-aggression pact. The German and Soviet armies had held a military parade celebrating the turnover on September 22, 1939. 21 months later, the Germans had decided to throw away that pact and now had to retake the fortress, which was on the front line on the very first day of the invasion. On June 22, 1941, Brest Fortress was garrisoned by about 9,000 Soviet troops, mostly from rifle brigades, but also from border forces and artillery. In addition, about 300 civilian family members of the garrison were also inside the fortress. For the Germans, the task of taking the fortress was assigned to the 17,000-strong 45th Infantry Division, which also had significant artillery and armored support. At first, Barbarossa struck like lightning. Within the first few hours of the attack, Soviet command and control were destroyed across the front, paralyzing command and preventing organized defense. Soviet air defense units had been operating under orders not to attack German planes for fear of provoking the Germans. In the initial confusion, as many as 2,000 Soviet aircraft were destroyed on the ground. Communications were disrupted and supply depots were destroyed. Brest Fortress was the tip of the attack, described by some as the site of the first major battle of the campaign. There was an initial 29-minute artillery barrage, including the terrifying German Nebelwerfer rockets on the unprepared fortress. German troops crossed the Bach under the cover of the barrage, surprising the defenders, who were unable to mount an organized defense. The fortress was encircled by 9 a.m. But while the first phase of Operation Barbarossa moved quickly, and Army Group Center bypassed Brest's fortress and sped towards the city of Minsk, encircling and destroying entire Soviet army groups, the beleaguered defenders of Brest's fortress defended strong points. Caught by surprise, with many of their officers killed or wounded, outnumbered, short of supplies, and cut off from the outside world, they held their ground. German assaults were repulsed, and attempts to take the fortress stalled. Positions were only taken after fierce fighting, and often resistance only stopped when a building was completely leveled to the ground. The civilians carried supplies, got at enemy movements, and even took up arms. On the 26th, some of the defenders tried to break out, but were unsuccessful. Unable to break defenders in the eastern fort, the Germans finally had their air force bomb it to rubble. The commander of the 45th Division did not declare the fortress captured until June 30th, a stunning defense given the odds. Yet isolated defenders kept fighting, with some holding on possibly as late as July 23rd, although there's little record of that defense. Graffiti found inside the fortress read, We'll die, 
but will not leave the fortress. In the end, Soviet casualties in the defense of Brest Fortress were about 6,800 captured and 2,000 killed. German casualties were 429 killed and 668 wounded. And if that doesn't sound like a large number, it's really a huge number. It represents nearly 5% of the total German casualties on the Eastern Front in June of 1941. At a time of almost universally disastrous news for the Soviet Union, the defense of Brest Fortress represented a heroic stand at a point when the rest of the front was in near total collapse. But strategically, the battle was of little importance. The crossroads of the city of Brest were captured by the German army on the very first day. The defense of Brest Fortress is interesting in that it was literally forgotten history for a period of time. Because the fortress was cut off from outside communication, the Soviets didn't even know that the battle had been fought and they until they captured some of the records of the German 45th Infantry Division in March of 1942. And the defense of Brest Castle wasn't widely publicized in the Soviet Union until the mid-1950s. A museum at the fortress was opened in 1956 and an investigative report on the surviving defenders published in 1957. It then became a point of pride and of Soviet propaganda, stressing fraternity between the people of Russia and Belarus. The propaganda at times has overstated the defense, including a narrative that the fortress held out for 32 days, while in fact organized defense lasted nine days. The fortress was designated a hero fortress in 1965, and the Memorial Heroic Breast Fortress Complex was opened in 1971. Despite its initial success, Operation Barbarossa eventually collapsed in the battle for Moscow. Today, it is considered by many to be amongst the worst military blunders in history and the key cause of the final defeat of Nazi Germany. The so-called Eastern Front was one of the bloodiest, most brutal conflicts in human history and was characterized by things like war crimes, mistreatment of the civilian population, brutal treatment of prisoners of war, cost the lives of nearly 26 million Soviet citizens. The museum at Brest is still very popular, and the defense of Brest Fortress is well known in Belarus and Russia, but still nearly forgotten here in the West. The defenders of Brest Fortress, cut off, outnumbered, and outgunned, are a symbol of the determination of the Soviet people in what the Russians call the Great Patriotic War. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Next up, the History Guy talks about the fearsome Night Witches. Over 800,000 women enlisted in the Soviet Armed Forces in the Second World War, a war that Russia still calls the Great Patriotic War. And while they are heroes there, the exploits of those women are relatively unknown here in the United States. But that's why we have the History Guide, to remind us of people that we really should remember. And if you have never heard of the famed Night Witches of the Soviet Union, you really should, because they were fierce. It all started with one extraordinary personality, Marina Roskova. The first female navigator in the Soviet Air Force, she set several long-distance flying records in the 1930s. When she and her crew set the international women's record for straight-line long-distance flight in 1938, they were recognized with the Hero of the Soviet Union Award, the first women so recognized, and the only ones prior to the Second World War. Russia tended to be more open to women in the military than a number of nations were. In, in the First World War, they had fielded one of the very first all-female combat units. And the situation was dire in the Great Patriotic War, where over 800,000 women signed up for the Soviet Armed Forces. But the Soviet Air Force was still unsold on the idea of women combat pilots. And while there was no official restriction, they tend to set up administrative burdens that made it impossible for a woman to get a combat pilot commission. But Marina Roskova was a hero of the Soviet Union, and she personally knew Stalin. And she was able to leverage that relationship to get Stalin to authorize the creation of an all-female flying corps. The Corps included three regiments, and Roskova herself died in an accident, leading one of those regiments. All three saw distinguished service, but only one would remain all-female throughout the entire war, and earned a special reputation worth noticing. The 588th Night Bomber Regiment, the Night Witches of the Soviet Union. Night bombing in the Second World War tended to be a high-tech affair, using the latest aircraft and the newest navigational techniques and technology in order to navigate through the darkness. Not so much the 544th. The 544th were equipped with this 1928 biplane, the Polikarpov PO-2. 
The PO2 was a slow, steady two-seat design, mostly used for training. And because it was produced in an agricultural variant, it had the less than complimentary nickname Kukuruznik, or crop duster. It was easy to fly, but it was very slow, carried a very small bomb load, and it was very fragile. A hit from one tracer round could easily set the whole plane on fire. But the Kukuruznik did have its strengths. It could, for example, take off and land with a very short runway. It didn't require a paved airstrip at all, just a good flat field. It could fly steady at very low altitudes, and because it was so slow, it could actually turn on a dime. And its top speed was slower than the stall speed of most German pursuit fighters, which actually made it very difficult for them to target. It would have been suicide flying a plane like that during the day. It would have been easy for anti-aircraft guns to shoot down. But at night, flying at treetop level, it was extremely difficult to target. And its engine made a, a peculiar noise, which the Germans likened to a sewing machine, which was described as nerve-wracking. But more terrifying was the way the plane was used in the bombing attack. The pilot would gear up and go to a high altitude and then cut the engine and glide over the target as they dropped their bombs. With no engine noise, it was extremely difficult to target and shoot at the aircraft. But even worse, really, was the eerie whistling noise that went through the wings as the plane was dropping its bombs, which the Germans thought sounded like witches flying on their brooms, and thus the Germans gave them the nickname Night Witches, a nickname that they eagerly embraced. One downside, though, flying at low altitudes like that made parachutes worthless, and so they didn't even carry them. The 544th started flying in June of 1942 under the command of Yevdokia Vershinskaya. The regiment flew harassment and precision bombing missions. And because the planes carried such a small bomb load, the way that they would do it is that they would sneak up to a field close to the enemy lines at dusk with all their support vehicles. They didn't fly in any kind of formation, they just took off at regular intervals, flew a few miles across the lines to where the Germans were, dropped their bombs, and then returned back to the airfield to reload. And they would continue doing that until dawn, when they would fly back to their base. There were no radios in the aircraft, so they had no communication while they were flying. Early in the war, there was a fear that the battlefield moved so quickly, the Germans were advancing so fast, that they never knew when they took off if, by the time it came to land, that their runway would still be behind their own lines. When it was too muddy and their planes would sink in the mud, they would just go rip up nearby fences, lay the fence post down in a line, and use that as their runway. They would fly sometimes as many as eight or more missions in a single night. It was an extremely dangerous way to fly, and most of them would suffer through multiple crashes or injuries during their career. At its height, the regiment had 40 two-women air crews, and it was truly an all-women regiment. All the ground and support crews, all of the command, every person in the regiment was a woman. By February of 1943, the 544th had distinguished itself enough to be retitled as an elite guards unit, the 46th Guards Night Bomber Aviation Regiment. The night witches certainly proved an important point, that women pilots could be just as effective in combat as men. At the end of the war, the 46th had flown over 24,000 missions and dropped 23,000 tons of bombs. Every pilot in the regiment had flown more than 800 combat missions by the end of the war. It was the most highly decorated all-female unit in the Soviet Air Force, with 23 members winning the award Hero of the Soviet Union. 30 women of the regiment lost their lives during the war. They were used quite a lot in Soviet propaganda during the war, and they're still well remembered in Russia today, but it's hard to say if the Night Witches really changed culture. For example, the Russian military today thinks that it is too stressful for women to be combat pilots, and there are no women serving as pilots in the Russian armed forces today. 
The United States didn't start allowing women to be combat pilots until 1993, and they still represent a fairly small percentage of our trained combat pilots. And it wasn't until just last year, 2016, that the United States opened all combat roles in the military to availability to women. I guess the wheel of culture turns slowly, but isn't that all the more reason that we should remember the heroism of the night witches of the Soviet Union? Now's the part of the episode where we get to chat with the history guy. A little bit about what we just heard, what we're going to hear, and of course, some behind the scenes stuff that you only get to hear about on the podcast. I think in any any time we talk about the Eastern Front, the, the first initial thing and the biggest question that uh, generally comes to my mind is why didn't Stalin see that there was an attack coming? And do, do you have any insight on that? I, well, I mean, maybe not more than any other historian who's talked about that over a long time. But I mean, you have to admit that Stalin was in a difficult position there. And we've been in that position, and it's actually fairly common, where, you know, you know that, that there's tension there. Uh, you are afraid to build up defenses because you are afraid that you will be accused of, of heightening the situation. Uh, and so you're kind of stuck if you, if you build up or you don't build up. Either way, you can kind of get in trouble. We were in the same position in the Pacific. Uh, and you can make the same argument that we were unprepared in the Pacific because preparing alone could have precipitated the situation. But uh, it seems clear when you look at it that Stalin thought that he had more time, that they had fairly recently signed the non-aggression pact pact that they had an agreement of what was going to go on in Poland uh, and so that he thought he would have another couple of years to prepare prepare for it but on the other hand you know new recordings of Hitler having him just shocked at the T-34 and the number of tanks that the Soviets had uh, suggested that Hitler was also caught off guard by what they ran into and so I mean it's, I think they were both in a position where neither could really prepare for the other without being accused of being the one that started the war that's true uh, there's some fair argument kind of both ways on that uh, because I, I, it's easy to argue to say that the Germans were really not as prepared for that war as they thought they were. Yeah, I, I mean, they, you know, the story is that uh, Russia didn't do very well when they were fighting Finland, and, and Hitler thought that Russia would be a pushover. Uh, and in many ways it was. I mean, gosh, if you look at the beginning of Barbarossa. Uh, but, I mean, that's kind of the story of Russia, too. I mean, they, they're uh, throughout history, they, they had these massive armies, but they were mostly levy armies and, and uh, not well-trained and not well-equipped. Uh, and uh, they could take massive losses, but they would still end up in the end winning because, you know, general winter would come along and you know freeze out the enemy so i mean you know hitler looked uh, very much like napoleon and his attack on russia yeah. you know and uh, you could say either of them were you know geniuses or idiots either which way but i mean it actually looks very very similar in terms of you know, what happened and how the defense happened yeah and uh, you know in these two episodes uh, well especially in, in the defense of breast fortress we're really talking about the very very beginning yeah and it's those well gosh in, in those first few years in this every summer the germans would just run rampant yeah yeah they and, overran whole, and whole armies and so i mean the, the thing that's interesting about breast fortress and and honestly you know it's, and what can you say about i mean it was it was intended to be a fortification to be a, a roadblock yeah. and they, you know they just bypassed it but on the other hand they held out far longer than you than you, they thought you would i mean sorry what you would say about breast fortress is not necessarily anything strategic you just could simply say uh that in a time when the kind of the the, the impression is that the, the soviets were just running uh, they were actually quite brave, uh, and uh, they were willing to make stands where they could. And I think that's I think that's meaningful. It is to say that it wasn't. I mean, th there were all sorts of reasons that uh, entire Russian armies could be wiped out er early in Barbarossa, but it wasn't that yeah. they were cowards. Uh, and Breast Fortress yeah. shows that that they were they weren't cowards. But it's also I mean, there's just an interesting story there that, that I mean that this medieval fortress was able to hold out against you know the Luftwaffe and the and the artillery and 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 uh, you know the, the the Panzers and I mean that it's really kind of you know fascinating. Say that they could still just run around and hide in spots in this fortress and keep fighting for, for yeah. months on end. Uh, and do so even, I'm totally incommunicado. The only way they found out about the stand at Breast Fortress was that after the German units were finally surrendered, uh, after Stalingrad, they captured their, their records. And that's where they found out that the fighting went on much longer than they realized. It's quite, that's quite an incredible, uh, that's quite an incredible it is. <laughs> way to discover it. Because, well, I mean, of course, the Germans were, were not going to uh, trumpet any kind of uh, Yeah, yeah, they, they weren't going to talk about it, no. So, and, uh, and yeah. Uh, totally so, cut I, off. It really makes for, and, and that really makes for, for forgotten history, except that now it's been kind of rediscovered and there's all sorts of, you know, memorials into it and stuff like that. that I mean, the, 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 the Soviets certainly had reason to tout it. But, I mean, I think yeah. it's an interesting story and it's, it's almost totally unknown in the West. I mean, and the story, though, you know, Poland built this fortification for a different time then the Germans took it from the Polish had to give it back to the Russians and then had to take it from the Russians uh, it's all really you know it really makes for a fascinating bit of history 
It is. It's interesting that even on the, you know, and I guess maybe the Soviet units were not necessarily trained to be, uh, you know, doing their own on their own, working on their own initiative, because uh, they were they were shocked even even and they're you know mm -hmm. they they must have been sitting I mean mere miles from where there was German buildup, uh, but there was they they were still totally shocked. But when you when you talk about the the casualty numbers that most of them were captured, then several thousand were killed. I mean the the whole the whole garrison there were, I mean there was almost no one who who yeah almost made no one got there. out of there alive yeah yeah uh, even the ones that were captured most of those never got home so yeah. from the early in Barbarossa. So, I mean, they were certainly, I mean, and, you know, the, it, you could say fighting for your homeland, except that they were in Poland. So it's hard, yeah. <laughs> hard to say. Uh, it's just, I mean, it's, uh, but it's, it's a bit of history uh, that not well known at all in the West. Uh, and it is, I mean, the stand was certainly brave, no matter what it meant to the overall battle or anything like that. It was, it was something yeah. that deserves to be remembered. Yeah, it might have been strategically, ultimately. It, yeah, I mean, it didn't not, mean much. Not but I mean, much, if you if but... you have to leave troops in your rear to, to clean up pockets, I mean, that, that's distracting troops and things oh, like true. that. But I mean, in you know, in the end, Brest Fortress did not hold the Germans back, and you know, they just drove around and kept driving. Uh, so, so I mean, did it did it, it clearly didn't have a massive impact on the battle because the Soviets didn't even know it had happened. Uh, but uh, but it, it it still has meaning in terms of you know those people yeah. there fought, uh, and they fought to the death, and they fought bravely, and they fought despite being outnumbered and being you know bombarded and uh and those people deserve to be remembered you know however that you want to tell a story yeah you, you look at them and think you know how did they keep any kind of uh, any kind of hope to continue to keep fighting uh they they could i mean they had no idea for one just how far the germans had gone past them uh, i can't imagine yeah, they had no they, idea they didn't know if they were holding off a german yeah. advance or what they had nothing they didn't they were totally cut off from communication and continued fighting yeah. But I mean that so happened. They, they uh, that, no idea. I mean that happened in some of the Japanese fortresses, and that happened. I mean yeah. that, that happened, you know, in different places in the war. Uh, this is just one of those stories, and it's a, it's a really a good one. And I think that they're all. I mean, they're all worth t telling. And I think that these, you know, that's the, a really yeah. human story of these people who uh, were well, and, and otherwise would be forgotten. I mean, they, they, yeah. what they did literally was was nearly forgotten, could be forgotten, and so it, to me, it deserves to be remembered, and that's why we tell the story. To, to some extent, I, I do think that Breast Fortress can show a little bit. It's one of those first kind of places where you can see that maybe the Germans had uh, miscalculated somewhat about just how weak the Russians were going to be. And of course, oh, absolutely, uh, yeah. I mean, well, I mean, they certainly they, found that out later. They finally, you know, figured out yeah. that they, what they'd learned in the Winter War was not necessarily, uh, you know, evidence of, 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 especially as you got closer and closer to Moscow. But uh, yeah, I mean, that, I don't know. I mean, honestly, I don't know what the expectation. You, you, you got you have to think the Germans saw that there would be, you know, roadblocks along the way that the Soviets would put up a fight. But I mean, this was the first sign, maybe as Barbarossa was rolling around, uh, that it wouldn't just yeah. be the pushover that they thought that it would be. Yeah. Even even though so much of it uh, was, yeah. I mean, they captured millions and a whole armies. And yeah, I mean, you have it's... to you have to think that they're you know like, whoa, this is this is awesome. You know, this is as, as easy as we took Poland. Yeah. The, yeah. Where was the sign <laughs> that this was not going to be that way? And, and you could say maybe the sign wasn't until the Battle of Moscow, but maybe yeah. you know maybe there were signs before that to say that you know when, uh, you know when they're cornered, uh, these are these could be a very intransigent, yeah. very difficult enemy. Which is which is a good uh, that's I mean that's a fairly good connection to you know what eventually does happen at Moscow. So yep. it's uh, uh, you know I was looking at some statistics today and and you talk about it here the scale the, the sheer scale of the invasion of yeah. uh, Barbarossa. Is, yes, it's crazy. I, I, yeah. Yeah, we like to we like to talk about D Day, which was different because it was yeah. amphibious. But I mean, it was a, yeah. it was nothing in terms of scale of invasion as the size of Barbarossa. And, and we Americans don't always Western allies don't always understand that this war was really fought in the East. I mean, there's a lot of different argument about that. And because I mean, uh, Stalingrad came before you know Normandy, uh, and, uh, and you know was the war over before the Western allies even made that second front? It's a, it's an interesting question. Uh, but I mean, on the other hand, you have to. I mean, one of the things that we find out from this period is. You know, Stalin could have chosen not to join the Allies if he thought he could beat the Germans on his own, and and uh, and he would have chosen not to join the Allies if he thought he could beat. He had nothing to gain from joining the Allies except that he didn't think he could beat the Germans on his own. So I mean, it's still, uh, it's still an Allied effort. I mean, that's what you really find out from the war. But uh, this is, you know, this. Uh, you know, the fact that we missed that, uh, you know, what, nine out of every 10 Germans that were killed in the Second World War were killed by Russians. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting in that as much time as we put into thoughts, you know, the, the things like the Bulge and uh, Anzio and, and Normandy and, and, and uh, those, you know, the things that we think were, you know, massive uh, were, were really fairly small in scale compared to, you know, the slaughter that was going on in the East.
And I think they, I mean, I think they were important. And I mean, there's a reason why Stalin always wanted the allies to open up a second front. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it yeah. was, it was important that there were, there were troops on the Atlantic wall, uh, you, you know, even at the beginning of the, the yeah, invasion. absolutely. And, and uh, you know, this, you know, the, the distraction of the Luftwaffe in, in the Battle of Britain yeah. was, I mean, that was, uh, no matter what you want to say about the German land forces, so the, the huge percentage of their, uh, of their air force was distracted. If, if yeah. England had sought a separate peace after Dunkirk, uh, then that meant Hitler had the the North uh, uh, the oil from North Africa. Uh, I mean, yeah. you, you could say that the the Africa Corps is relatively small given what was fighting on the Eastern Front, but you could also say that the battle on the Eastern Front was close enough that had the Africa Corps been able to you know entirely be utilized, had the Luftwaffe been able to entirely be utilized, if the Kriegsmarine was not having to fight the Battle of the Atlantic, and that is a significant yeah. shift of resources, and you know might might the Soviets not have been able to respond to that, uh, you know, and then that also leads to the counter question, though, is um, you, you can ask the question, would Russia have won without the Allies? But I mean, like, what would the Western Allies have been? without Russia, if those 90% yeah. of the German troops could have been focused on. And, and that's yeah. <laughs> an interesting question, because, you know, was there any situation where Hitler could successfully have made it across the channel and invaded? I mean, did the, did the German army just have the capacity for that? Uh, uh, yeah. uh, the, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, it's all an interesting question. And what happened, happened. You know, we were allies. Yeah. Uh, and one of the reasons that we don't remember it very well is because we were very quickly moved from allies to rivals to enemies. Yeah. Uh, and so we didn't want to talk about it. But it's funny, you can find, you know, films from the war talking about how wonderful the Russian people are free and and, yeah. and diverse and do, 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 do. you know like there are allies <laughs> and then, well, like the, two the years later the same companies make and you know this is why we fight the Ruskies uh, and, it, and you know, yeah. it's it's kind of funny how that all shifted too so I, I I think that we don't know enough about those battles I think that we don't appreciate yeah. enough that it was meaningful that we were allies because we remember the Cold War and we forget that period where uh, where we allied together and because of that we were able to do something you know that I mean uh, how different would the world be if, had we not allied because could either of us or all of us have lost to to the to the Reich yeah and those are I mean ultimately you know talking about how it could have gone they're all interesting things to talk about but you're right we're we're here for history and ultimately it happened the way it happened uh, it's it is interesting that I, I like I was reading a statistics thing that said uh, something like 80 percent of the German army was on the Eastern Front in 41 and 42 and it remained more than half throughout the rest of the yeah, war throughout the rest of the and war, yeah. it's it's I mean it was crazy and it was like you mentioned I mean it was close uh, the the defense at Moscow was uh, was, it was close. You, yeah, you could to some extent call that desperate. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it yeah. Was, so it so was, it's, uh, it's hard to divorce uh, lend lease and the impact that uh, yeah. Allied support had, and and uh, uh, so I mean it's uh, it's those things called counterfactuals to say what if this had happened yeah. differently. I mean those are always interesting to speculate. Uh, what we know is that what did happen was itself a close enough call that if it had happened yeah. differently, it could have been a significant difference. It could have and that could have been the difference over you know winning and losing. Uh, you know, it's you know who knows, and then you can ask you know, all sorts of questions about how how if we had dealt with the post war differently. I, I honestly don't know. Yeah, and then the the other episode we listened to, which is a little less on big strategic uh, things, but talking more about some just a really really interesting group of people, is the Night Witches. Yeah, the Night and Witches. My my first thought is that is absolutely the coolest name. <laughs> I, there's almost no well, other group in the history. Cool thing, that has the a most cool name. thing about that name is that it was given to them by their enemies, and yeah, those are those are the yeah. best names, the <laughs> nicknames. Uh, and there, are, you know, there are a lot of those that have been given and, and, and embraced. But yeah, the, you know, they uh, especially because they, you know, they, the plane, sort of planes that were flying, they would literally turn the aircraft off. All you would hear is something swishing like a broom, and these bombs would be falling. So you know, again, it's hard to say how much did night, which is really impact the war as as you know one unit that did fairly small bombing. But you can say that they certainly did impact the war, and that it was meaningful, and that the Germans were very terrified yeah. of them. And you can't deny their heroism. I mean, my gosh, no. in the Second World War, to go up in a crop duster, flying at night. Uh, it's taking off from a field very close to enemy lines. You don't yeah. know your field isn't going to be captured before that you go home. Uh, and, you know, turn off your airplane and chuck bombs out the back. And that was yeah. what you're doing. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> you knew that you would not be treated well if the uh, if you were yeah. captured. Uh, so, I mean, what a what a brave uh, group of women and, and how extraordinary uh, that. Uh, I mean, we had our women's service pilots, the WASP and things like that. But I mean, how extraordinary that you had this entire unit that was entirely every mechanic, every officer, yeah. all of the pilots and, the, and everybody. And there was entirely women fighting there on the Eastern Front. It's just another great, compelling, interesting story that deserves to be remembered. Probably a little bit more known in the West than than Breast Fortress. Yeah. But still, I don't think that that many Westerners really knew the details on that. 
Yeah, it's it's an amazing story. It's it is interesting, you know. I feel like I mean, I do think that like people know that there were women in the uh, in you know fighting with the Red Army. Uh, what they th there's yeah, the, I think they hear more about the, the snipers and stuff like, and that, stuff like but, that than they do yeah. the yeah. And that's just how how desperate it was. One of the sad parts of that yeah. story is that uh, immediately as the war's over, I mean, uh, the, you know, the feeling was, you know, you you should be a mother, and and you know, they, that was you know very quickly moved back. It wasn't representing some you know enlightenment regarding yeah. the the genders uh, in in Russia. It was it was a war exigency that was quickly you know went away as soon as the war yeah. was over. Yeah. As as many millions of people as they had, uh, they you know that were were mobilized. It's still you know eight hundred thousand women who served in the Red Army, yeah. uh, or with in. The, I mean that was a, that's a large that's number, but it's still a and fairly you, you small did, number. You did face to... uh, more risk. I mean, you faced more risk. The Germans oh, yeah. did not respect that you used women in combat. They considered that to be immoral, and so you, know, you were uh, you were likely to not just be killed, but actually to be you know, grievously mistreated before you were killed. And, and yes. so that's, they were taking that risk and they were willing to take that risk. And I, th I think people know more maybe about some of the snipers and stuff like that than they really yeah. know about this whole, this whole unit of the night witches. But I mean, what they did is just, oh my gosh, I can't imagine, I don't, I can't yeah. imagine taking your airplane off from a field in the dark, you know, <laughs> when it was too muddy, they just pulled up the fence posts and laid them in a row and took off on that. And, and yeah, they, uh, oh. and uh, virtually all of them, uh, you know, uh, survived crashes uh, because those planes just crashed a lot. Uh, and they, you know, they were flying they in very were dangerous ways. Yeah, I mean, you're flying. You, they gave you the lowest tech airplane you had. I mean, it would be like you know, if you're in the midst of war, and they're like, "Well, we're gonna we're gonna put all the crop dusters into combat." There you go. Yeah, yeah. Go go get yeah. in the plane that well, you used to fly was, over it's, your its nickname field. was uh, Kukurucha, which meant sewing machine because that's what the engine sounded like. And that's. Then, yeah. I, uh, that's that's funny in and of itself, but it's also I mean, can you imagine getting in a thing that has an engine that uh, sounds like a sewing machine? Yeah, clip, clip, clip. <laughs> and, yeah. Well, and in, you're gonna go in, drop bombs. Yeah, out of in, in in 1940. Yeah, you know, you know, going flying against the the Luftwaffe. But and it was you know there, there was uh, there were no night fighter uh, technologies yet at the time, uh, and uh, you couldn't target your anti aircraft because they would literally turn the engine off and just be so, so you don't know where they were. And, and it's uh, the strategy of it is really interesting. What it meant because it was mostly yeah. just terror bombing. I mean, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't destroying armies. It was just keeping people up all night and that meant that they didn't fight nearly as well during the day uh, and but I mean for I think the unit certainly had an outsized effect given the size of the unit that their tactics were certainly yeah. fascinating uh, and that the women of the night witches were incredible heroes who deserved to be remembered yeah I, I have to imagine that I mean it's difficult to uh, you know try to put a number to exactly what kind of uh, what kind of impacts they yeah. had but I, how do you do that how do you how do you do that with any unit yeah yeah and it's and especially I mean honestly the Soviets were very interested in making heroes. There's a lot of propaganda involved, yes. and so it's I mean it's it's you know that, so they're going to tout victories maybe more than than is responsible. But I mean there's there's no measure of courage where that was just an <laughs> incredibly brave thing to do. You know you're getting in a plane that would you were brave just to get in the yeah, plane. Yeah, I mean the, 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 <laughs> the way they drop bombs is literally they carried them in the back seat with them and they threw them out. The, I mean, threw them, just this, threw them out. That's, the, yeah, that's what you use it as your World War II technology. Ooh. And then you fly back in the dark, and if you miss your field or if your field's been captured, you just crash into a tree somewhere, and you know they go get another airplane. Yeah, that's the or they because they man they could move those. Well, it was yeah yeah they, 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 yeah they, yeah, yeah the airfield was just a field yeah so they would just you know they were constantly on the move and. They had to be living in incredibly rough conditions, and, and oh, yeah. uh, but I mean, flying that, landing in the dark, landing in muddy fields and stuff like that. I mean, there was every bit of that. I mean, they were taking ridiculous risks every single time they deployed, and they would sometimes fly, you know, multiple, you know, ten, twelve missions a night. They would go throw their bombs, land, get more bombs, go throw them, land, uh, and they would keep doing that. And and uh, then they, you know, they get shot down and they limp back and they, yeah. you know, go do it again. Each time, knowing that, I mean, these were planes that. Uh, yeah, if if almost anything hit them, oh, yeah. uh, there was a good chance they were going to Yeah, there was down. no armor on and that <laughs> plane. Yeah, if it hit it, the plane was going to go down or it was going to go straight through the, the plane. Or, I mean, they couldn't, they weren't built to withstand yeah. any sort of damage. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I, the, the, truly 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 brave and it is, I, I do think it's interesting that, yeah, it was not, it was not any kind of uh, really feminist version of the Soviets or anything. No. They, they just, and they I'm not sure needed. if you talked to the. I'm I'm not even sure that they saw feminism the way that Rosie the Riveter saw feminism. I think that they felt that Probably they were not. just doing their duty. But I mean, there had to be some some meaningful pride there to the fact that they had an all female. I mean, because all, all those squadrons they made with women, that was the only one that was all female. All the mechanics, all everything was female. And, you know, it'd be, it's for all that we hear about the genders today, it would be interesting to see how did that really operate differently. I mean, I wonder if on the ground, yeah. in the way that orders worked, and the way that discipline worked, and the way that mechanics worked, and the way they talked to each other. You know, was it, 
you know, would you have known the difference or was it was there truly a difference in the way? But uh, you know, who knows? But I mean, uh, what we can say is that they were a very interesting unit that was certainly historically a, you know, a novelty worth discussing uh, and that they were clearly heroes and very brave. And, you know, yeah. it's a, a, again, it's a good story. It's one of those stories where, you know, I don't know. I think there's been a, actually a movie made in Russia, but I don't know why we haven't seen uh, a movie about it because, I mean, you know, gosh, this is this is one of those where truth is, is more interesting than, than most of the plots would come up with in fiction. Magellan TV is sponsoring this episode, and they sponsor all of our podcasts. And if you've listened to the podcast, you know that what we like to do is talk about what we've been watching on Magellan TV lately. And so what have you been watching on Magellan TV? Well, you know, I was flipping through, and I saw that they've already put up their Halloween stuff. Uh, don't know why. You know, I'm not one of those that would actually start celebrating Halloween in August, but that's what caught my attention. And so I watched something called Vampire Island. It is uh, researchers that are researching the cultural traditions that led to vampire myths. Uh, and that's and, and I actually you know learned a lot of stuff. So some of it I kind of I you know I'd heard of before, but I mean it's it's really kind of interesting to talk about how I, that some of the things I didn't actually know how that worked. For example, there's there's graveyards in Greece that have been filled for centuries and centuries, and so you you get to bury your your loved one for three years, then you're supposed to dig them up and remove the bones to an ossuary. I you know I didn't know that. <laughs> that's not how we do it here. <laughs> and, no. <laughs> and, and so part of that was you know every once in a while you dig one up and they hadn't rotted because of you know however they were preserved. And they're like oh they're a vampire, then they, you know, drive nails to them. And, uh, and it's kind of interesting. I, I didn't know that. And there were actually quite a bit of, I didn't know that. So it came up in this episode about, uh, you know, how that could have come to the legend. And, and uh, it was, it was a lot of fun. It really was. It wasn't, it wasn't just telling a vampire story. It really was uh, telling the story of how cultural traditions could lead to vampire myths. Uh, and it's, it, you know, the, the, the breadth of things that you can get on Magellan TV is always amazing. And this one was another one. It's just, I, I was, I was glued to it the entire time. You know, I was surprised when it was over. Because I, you know, I lost track of time because it was just so fun to watch, and yeah, I learned a lot. So, so what have you been? What have you been watching lately on on Magellan TV? So, what I was watching, and I honestly, I was looking through their whole list, and gosh, there's just so, there's literally so many things that you could watch, and there were so many that I almost did watch. Uh, but what I, what I eventually settled on was this one called Cherub of the Mist, and it's about red pandas. Oh, and wow. uh, if, 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 you, if you've ever seen a red panda, first of all, they're cute. They're cute as heck. I mean, my goodness, those are cute little animals. Yeah. <laughs> when they're startled, they go, they're like, ah, they, they throw their hands up. Yeah, they're, I, it is. It is just so this this was a, an Indian researcher. And what she was doing was that they had released. These were the first two red pandas released that had been born in captivity and they were releasing them into, into the wild. And so they gave them little radar collars and let them into the wild to, to hope that they would help uh, preserve the species. And it's it is a touching story about these red pandas and some other red pandas that they find. It's honestly a bit emotional. I, I mean, they're just so cute that you can't help but pretty much, you know, immediately be in love with them. So everything that every bad thing that could happen to these red pandas, they're like, oh, they're clouded leopards. And you're like, oh, no, <laughs> no, don't hunt them. All they do is throw their hands up when they get scared. What are they supposed to do? And the person who narrated it is the, the actually the woman who did the study. And she's clearly just very passionate about these red pandas and about protecting their uh, protecting the red pandas and their habitats and working with locals to make sure that this is that they value. Uh, the red pandas and I, I think it was really 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 worth watching again it's called cherub of the mist and of course if you are a listener or watcher of the history guy you can always go to try.magellantv.com slash history guy where we will always have a deal for you sometimes a free month or a deal on an annual membership or even a documentary that you can watch for free again that's try.magellantv.com slash history guy Next up, the History Guy talks about Pamphilov's 28 Guardsmen and the Battle for Moscow. And stay tuned after the episode to hear us chat a little more with the History Guy. The Battle for Moscow, fought between October 1941 and January 1942, is considered one of the great turning points of the Second World War. In a 2005 lecture to the Wilson Center for International Studies, the former British ambassador to the Soviet Union, Roderick Braithwaite, said of the battle that it was the first defeat for the German army. The website of the Wilson Center explains that in terms of the numbers involved, it was the largest battle of the Second World War and that by some estimates, Soviet losses in that one battle equaled the combined losses of the United States, the British, and the French for the entire war. The Battle of Moscow was simply a battle fought on an epic scale of a people defending their homeland. And one of the great legends of that battle 
Panfilov's 28 Guardsmen has come to represent in Russia the sacrifices made by the Red Army in the Great Patriotic War. And that legend raises interesting questions about the nature of heroism and the importance of legends themselves. It is history that deserves to be remembered. The German forces allotted to the invasion of the Soviet Union, codenamed Operation Barbarossa, included nearly 150 army divisions and more than 3 million troops. There are disagreements over the total numbers, but the force included more than 6,000 tanks and armored vehicles, 4,000 aircraft, tens of thousands of artillery pieces, and over 600,000 horses. It was, says the Encyclopedia Britannica, in effect the largest and most powerful invasion force in human history. While the operation can be seen as representing the key ideological struggle of the war, it was a battle of enormous strategic importance. Germany was seeking control of vital agricultural regions and oil reserves. The plan called for the capture of Moscow, the capital of the Soviet Union and its largest city, within four months. But Hitler's armies were facing a formidable obstacle, as the Wilson Center webpage explains. In June 1941, the Soviet Union had the world's largest army and air force, more tanks than the rest of the world combined, and Stalin had an immense amount of intelligence indicating the likelihood of a German attack. Operation Barbarossa was a massive clash of arms, and to many analysts, the fate of the war in Europe hinged on the ability of the German army to quickly defeat the Red Army and knock the Soviet Union out of the war. And in the initial stages of the invasion, that goal seemed within reach. The massive Soviet air forces were largely destroyed on the ground. Some resources report that between 1,500 and 2,000 Soviet aircraft were destroyed by the German air force on the first day of the invasion. A Soviet archival document listed Soviet aircraft losses at 4,000 in the first three days of the invasion, against an estimated loss of just 78 German aircraft. Soviet command and control was disrupted, and Soviet leadership was slow to understand the scope of the invasion. A July 2011 issue of The Atlantic expresses the enormity of the initial Soviet losses. Within a single week, German forces advanced 200 miles into Soviet territory, destroyed nearly 4,000 aircraft, and killed captured or wounded, some 600,000 Red Army troops. The German capture of the city of Smolensk in July left Army Group Center only some 200 miles from Moscow. While many in the German High Command supported a push to Moscow, arguing that capture of the Russian capital would demoralize the Soviet Union, further advances would have left the group's flanks exposed, and Hitler himself decided that the forces of the German center would be used to help achieve the objectives of the Army Groups to the north and south. The pause gave the Russians more time to build defenses around Moscow, but it also contributed to success in the south, where an encirclement near the Ukrainian capital of Kiev resulted in another 700,000 casualties for the Red Army. By October, the Germans were again focused on Moscow in a strategic offensive called Operation Typhoon. The Germans committed three infantry armies, three panzer armies, and nearly two million men in the goal of capturing Moscow before the onset of the Soviet winter. The Soviet efforts to fortify Moscow in the face of their massive losses over the summer were nothing short of amazing. In his 1943 book, Moscow Dateline, American journalist Henry C. Cassidy, who observed the war in Russia at close range as Moscow's correspondent of the Associated Press, wrote, Moscow had been declared in a state of siege October 19th. The people of Moscow were called upon to play a major part in the drama of the life or death of their city. Men were called up throughout the city to participate in its defenses, most having been members of the Communist Party or youth organizations. These volunteers were formed in what was called Communist Divisions. Cassidy notes, The men appeared, carrying their own food and warm clothes, having already taken farewell of their families, and proceeded immediately to their barracks. Meanwhile, the women of Moscow were mobilized to help prepare the city's defenses. Thousands of women, mobilized by their house committees and still wearing their city clothes, went by train, bus and truck into the mud, slush and cold west of Moscow, there to dig tremendous trenches in anti-tank ditches. Soviet Marshal Georgi Zhukov, who commanded Soviet forces in the defense of the city, wrote that the efforts included some 250,000 women and teenagers who moved more than 3 million cubic meters of earth by hand without mechanical help. Shops throughout the city were turned to war production. Casting noted that a shop that had been making pots and pans started turning out hand grenades. In one of the more remarkable feats, the new site Russia Beyond describes a project that managed to hide the Kremlin, an area of nearly 28 hectares, or more than two square miles, from the German Luftwaffe. 
All the Kremlin towers were repainted using different colors and covered with wooden tents. Every roof inside the Kremlin was painted rusty brown so as to make them indistinguishable from typical Moscow roofs. The Kremlin grounds, paved with cobblestone, were covered up with sand. Tents, painted to look like roofs, were stretched over the Kremlin gardens, and facades of the buildings also painted to confuse the German pilots. While the German Air Force was much reduced by that point in the long campaign, the capital nonetheless suffered more than 120 air raids by combined more than 7,000 bombers. Still, Russia beyond notes that because of the camouflage, the Kremlin sustained no significant damage in those raids. In a remarkable event, in the midst of the battle, the Soviets held a military parade inside the besieged city on November 7, 1941, at 8 a.m. on the Red Square, on the occasion of the 24th anniversary of the October Revolution. The purpose of the parade was to boost city morale and dispel rumors that Stalin and the members of the Politburo had fled the city. The Soviet Air Force attacked German airfields the night before to suppress air attacks, and the covers were briefly removed from the towers at the Kremlin. Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin gave a speech, concluding, For the complete destruction of the German invaders, death to the German invaders, long live our glorious motherland, her liberty and her independence. Under the banner of Lenin, forward to victory. The men marched directly from the parade to the front lines, where many of them perished in the battle. Into this desperate defense came the men of the 316th Rifle Division, under General Ivan Vasilievich Panfilov. To defend the capital, the Soviets had brought in troops from far eastern military districts. The men of the 316th Logic came from the Kazakh and Kyrgyzst Soviet republics. These reserve units were called up after the opening stages of Operation Barbarossa. The soldiers of the division were sworn in on August 1st and immediately deployed to help defend the city of Leningrad. The division was assigned to the defense of Moscow in October. The division saw heavy fighting west of the city, and particularly stout fighting towards the end of October promoted Zhukov to recommend the division be decorated and be given a guards division title. In the heavy fighting, the division had taken significant casualties. The 1st Battalion of the 175th Rifle Regiment had been annihilated, and what was left had been folded into a company of the 2nd Battalion. On November 16th, members of the company were defending around a railway station against an assault by the German 2nd Panzer Army. Just over a week later, on the 24th, a reporter for the newspaper of the Soviet Ministry of Defense was told a second-hand story about a group of soldiers from the company who had held their position in the face of a German armored assault. The men were said to have held to the last. On November 26th, the newspaper reported, A group of soldiers was attacked by a column of 54 enemy tanks, but they did not flinch. The story noted that the enemy sustained 800 casualties and lost 18 tanks. An editorial in the paper the following day gave the number of defenders, 28. Penfilov had been killed by a mortar round on November 17th, and the division had been named in his honor, and has well been granted the title Guards, a recognition of elite status. The 28 still unidentified men who had died in the brave stand became known as Panfilov's 28 Guardsmen. The article was well received, especially by Stalin himself, and a reporter went to confirm more details. On January 22nd, another article was published, which for the first time noted the date, November 16th, and the location, Dubisekovo Station, of the fight. The story was reported to have been related by the unit's last survivor, a soldier named Ivan Notarov, who had been mortally wounded and gave details of the events before dying in a field hospital. The comprehensive history of the war, the history of the great patriotic war of the Soviet Union, published in 1960, described the action. The enemy employed 20 tanks. At that moment, Company Commissar V.G. Klochkov came to the trenches of tank destroyers. It's not that scary, he told the soldiers. There is less than one tank per person. The courageous Penfilov men destroyed 14 tanks with hand grenades, Molotov cocktails, and anti-tank rifles. The remaining tanks retreated. The soldiers barely had time to bandage their wounds before 30 more tanks attacked their position. Commissar Klochkov told the soldiers the words that would later become the slogan of all the Moscow defenders. Russia is vast, but there is nowhere to retreat. We have our backs to Moscow. Severely wounded, the commissar threw himself under an enemy tank with several hand grenades and blew it up. This heroic battle lasted for four hours. The enemy lost 18 tanks and dozens of soldiers, but failed to break through. The story was widely reported, and the 28 guardsmen became symbols of the heroic defense of Moscow. In 1942, poet Nikolai Tikhonov composed a poem about the battle. Among the roar of the walls of fire, in a lonely frozen trench, 28 family guards. The 28 became national heroes. 
in July 1942, the 28 were all posthumously awarded the title Hero of the Soviet Union. But questions about the story arose. Notably, at least four men who had been listed among the 28 were eventually found to be still alive. Two, in fact, were eventually arrested for the crime of having surrendered to the enemy. Despite the questions, the legend of the 28 remained an important part of the Soviet mythology of the battle. Monuments were built all over the Soviet Union. Streets were named after the 28 men. Memorial Park in the Kazakh city of Almaty is named in their honor. The importance of the story was underlined in 1966 when a Soviet magazine published an editorial asking why inconsistencies in the story had not been investigated. The article was denounced by none other than the Soviet head of state, General Secretary Leonid Brezhnev, who called the accusations slanders against the heroic history of our party and Soviet people. Brezhnev's comment seems interesting today because we now know that the story of the 28 Guardsmen was wholly fabricated, and in fact we know that Soviet leadership knew that as early as 1947. The arrest of a man who was supposed to have been one of the 28 resulted in an investigation by a military judge. In the course of the investigation, the unit's colonel said that there was heavy fighting in the area that day, but denied that the events described had ever occurred. The reporter who had written the story then admitted that he had made the entire story up, apparently with the goal of improving national morale. The report on the investigation, which was sent to Joseph Stalin, concluded that the event did not occur. It was described as a pure fantasy. Yet Stalin chose to let the nation continue to believe the legend. The public radio news program The World noted simply in 2015, Stalin needed the myth. The Germans failed to capture Moscow, and dreams of a quick defeat of the Soviet Union melted away into the long, drawn-out retreat on the Eastern Front in a, in, a, in a front that would eventually cost as many as 30 million lives. The battle was a turning point in many ways, not the least of which that Adolf Hitler, who was shocked by the defeat of his armies, took direct control of the German army and relieved most of his most experienced commanders, decisions that would negatively affect the German military throughout the rest of the war. There's controversy among historians over the Battle of Moscow. The common conception in the West is that the Germans were defeated by the early and abnormally cold Russian winter that year. An argument that, while it certainly holds some truth, is also dismissive of the massive effort of the Soviet army in the defense of their capital, despite the losses of the previous summer. But the legend of Panflov's 28 Guardsmen is one of the most intriguing legacies of the battle. The results of the 1947 investigation weren't largely brought before the public until 2015, when a Russian state archivist named Sergei Miranenko released the report. Miranenko's argument was that the more than a million Soviet troops that fought to defend the city should all be recognized rather than just the mythical 28, and yet, for releasing the report, he was removed from his position. The legend of Panflov's 28 Guardsmen raises an interesting question, because it's certainly not the only important national legend in the world today that might not be wholly based on historical fact. And it raises the interesting question about whether some history that isn't even necessarily really history still deserves to be remembered. The world quoted Sergei Medinsky, who's the Russian culture minister. He said, even if this story had been invented from start to finish, if there'd been no Panfilov, if there'd been nothing, this is a sacred legend that shouldn't be interfered with. People that do are filthy scum. So when we're talking about, you know, the, the sheer scale of the Eastern Front, I mean, one of the one of the places where that really becomes a uh, you can see some of that scales when it comes to Moscow, uh, mm -hmm. because, of course, I mean, they were taking huge chunks of the Soviet Union, uh, huge chunks of Russia and uh, other countries, uh, modern countries, Ukraine, places like that. But uh, everything ended up converging on Moscow mm -hmm. and it how that turned out mattered incredibly mm -hmm. to both sides yeah probably, and it's probably the closest thing you can say to a real turning point in the in the the war in europe yeah. was was moscow yeah and it's you know yeah, it's yeah. if you want a counterfactual what would have happened had moscow fallen i mean the argument is you know could they move beyond the ural mountains and eventually come back or whatever or would have knocked the soviets out uh and uh so i mean it was an incredibly important battle and a battle where literally they brought up i mean they were they were throwing you know prototype tanks and and uh, you know straight up volunteers you're in the party. Well, okay. Then here's a, here's a rifle and here's a jacket and go go shoot Germans. Nope. Uh, and so it, it really was a desperate to the end struggle that really could have meant the war. You know, 
uh, the war in the East, but I mean, maybe the whole war. I mean, if you think about how many resources yeah. the Germans could have shifted if they'd taken the Russians out. Yeah. And it's, of course, it's difficult to know exactly how many troops they would have had to, I mean, it would have been a huge frontier to defend <laughs> yeah. either way, but uh, it's, diff it's difficult to know. But at, at the time, everybody knew uh, who was in that battle, the, the Soviets and the Germans both knew that a lot was riding on that. Oh, yeah. And if the Germans couldn't capture Moscow, uh, then that was... <laughs> that was yeah, that well, was going to the war that, was going to go back the other direction. It was going to shift and go yeah. and go backwards. I think yeah. they all really realized what was on the line there. Yeah, yeah, and it and it did I, to some extent. You can say the high water mark was you know there in 1941, 42 when they try to try to take Moscow and they and they fail. I, the Germans were probably never closer. I don't think that in the you know by yeah the, to some the, the to some extent would say really allowed them to than, hold mainland Europe for yeah. for years on end. I mean that's what could have happened there. Yeah. So it's quite is you know the Western Allies might have said oh well. You know, we're stuck now. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe the, the Reich could have been the sort of, I don't know, about a 100-year Reich, yeah. but it might have been the Reich that Hitler was talking about where they, they actually dominated Europe for a, a good deal yeah. of time. And what they really wanted to do was to secure Ukraine and the, and the, and the, yeah. the grain of Ukraine and the fuel fields in Czechoslovakia. And, and, you know, taking Moscow might have been able to do that for them. Yeah. And, it, I, I mean, there's some, some argument there that uh, Ukraine might not have been everything that Hitler hoped it was. Uh, as far as as far as supporting supporting all of Europe kind of thing, but uh, we don't really <laughs> we never really were able to see what that might be turned into because there have been uh, a lot that, of wars over Ukraine because of the because yeah. of the, the food that's grown there. Yeah, it's certainly yeah. a breadbasket. Yeah, yeah. So it it was it was I mean the Barbarossa was what, what I don't know if there's there's not very many military operations that can even really compare. Oh, in, in scale, terms of I don't know anything size. really can yeah. to, to Barbarossa. Yeah. I mean, I don't think even the thing modern really compares to Barbarossa in terms of its its vast scale. I I can't even think. I mean, we the idea of thinking about a modern war on the scale of you know having uh, three million troops, uh, and that was just a, you know that was just on the German side. Uh, yeah, is, yeah, I don't think, we, I don't think we, we would think about it today. And uh, you know, it's hard. It's we're in such a different situation. Yeah, that's uh, but also I mean that. It, but also that you know this the size in terms of the geo, geographical size of this uh, offensive yeah. it was just absolutely unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, and that all that all kind of that all came down to Moscow, and and so Moscow was a yeah. and it's another battle that you know Americans are not necessarily very much familiar with, or you know, uh, uh, or ex exactly how it fit in context. Uh, but you can yeah. see how uh, in a in a nation that loves to make heroes of the fatherland you can see how that was that was the perfect place for it and so the story itself is really very interesting because the battle was so large uh, that they really needed yeah. to narrow it down to specific heroes and when they went to do that it was so chaotic they didn't have them and they made them up yeah. and that i mean that and there's so much about that i mean you have to say that 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 pamphlovs that the, you know that that group uh, there had to be, you know, dozens of groups very similar, you know, that were fighting in, yeah. in Moscow. You know, these guys had, had nothing but rifles and held on when they shouldn't have. And uh, but uh, but we didn't we didn't get to know their names, uh, and they had to have someone to hold up, and you know, they they held up a myth, uh, and that's so it's really because uh, it, you know, like the other stories, clearly heroes. Uh, but yeah. and you can't deny the heroism. I mean, there's importance to the battle and, and what people did fitting in the battle. But on the other hand, it really says something about the Soviet Union, uh, you know, how it turned out to be kind of a scandal in the end. Yeah. Uh, and it's all <laughs> it's all just it's a very strange story. But again, a story that deserves to be remembered, uh, but not remembered yeah. maybe the way that it is or has been. And that's that's one of the things that makes it so fascinating is that, you know, with the, you know, the, the story that we were told turns out not to be the real story. Uh, and that says something about yeah. the era and the time and everything, too. And it seems like, you know, at least in the initial, you know, those initial, the initial period, the, the Soviet leadership thought it was true. Um, but it, it didn't take too long for them yeah, to figure I, out that probably it was a point it when they, it was pretty obvious that it wasn't. And they continued yeah. to, to maintain the myth anyway. I mean, they made it very clear, you know, that we're yeah. going to maintain the myth. Uh, and, and that's, it's, I mean, that's And you, you have to wonder, I mean, how many, many stories of heroism end up being exaggerated in some ways. And you have to wonder how many of yeah. those are. I mean, when you study history like we do, sometimes you find that, that maybe the legend is is more than, than is real. Uh, sometimes the legend is less than, you know, what was real. Yeah. Uh, and so you have to wonder how many of the, you know, of the great stories that we have are, you know, ended up being embellished somewhere along the way. And people said, well, we can't change the story now because it's really what happened there. Yeah. Well, and as we've seen some of those where uh, people knew and said, uh, didn't say anything about yeah. it like this one. Yeah. Uh, and of course, uh, I'm sure there are something. more. Yeah. yeah, right. Well, and they, uh, gosh, even the guy who uh, to <laughs> made it clear in the in the modern era lost his job for yeah. for 
bringing up the records on it. Um, yeah, even and in the I, I get, era, yeah. Yeah, so that for for the Soviets, I do kind of understand why. I mean, there's got to be you know real stories of of that heroism, the, and yeah, even I, if it was, you can understand why in the Battle of Moscow, very few were writing that down. You know, I yeah. mean that's the real yeah. that's the real problem. Is that there was, a, I mean, when you're when you're just grabbing people off the street and giving guns and say go defend that block with your life, uh, that's a great story. But you never wrote, you never wrote down his name. You know, you know, vastly so and so, and he disappeared. Uh, and so I think it was partly you know a result of the chaos, but it was also partly the result of the way that they were doing you know propaganda under Stalin and the Soviet Union, uh, that they just took you know whatever nub of a story they had and they wrote a story out of it. And and, and there was probably more yeah. of that than you realize. Uh, and and it makes you wonder. I mean, you know, do, do we not know everything about the Night Witches? Do we not know everything about yeah. Breast Fortress? Because those are both uh, those were both you know aggrandized later. Uh, I mean, heroes yeah. heroes are heroes, and they're and they're made. But I mean, it really does say about the nature of the Soviet Union that uh, it, it, even from the initial reporter, truth was never all that important. Yeah. Uh, and so you know. Maybe and they, they would have known that the whole time. Yeah. I right? mean, that's, maybe not is that... that they didn't go seek out the real stories because that, that wasn't even the frame of mind. Yeah. The frame of mind was to write the yeah. story that had to be in the paper and you didn't really care where it came from. And, and so. And there wasn't necessarily, you know, in the uh, in the United States, for instance, uh, we had a, a long history of things like muckrakers uh -huh. uh, who were very interested in finding the truth. And if you were, uh, there uh -huh. were to some extent that, that that didn't really exist in Russia. Would have, I mean, a, a <laughs> lot of ways it didn't exist in war. I mean, because you'd say that also, I mean, about, that's also know, the Western allies too. Yeah. But I mean, it, yeah, the, that tradition, I mean, Russia never had a tradition of a free press, uh, never had yeah. a tradition of a press that wasn't subject to government. And so, uh, and, you know, we were telling, I mean, we told very similar stories about uh, men fighting the Pacific and Guadalcanal and things like that. We had various yeah. stories that were, looked very much like it. Uh, probably a better chance that we actually knew who it was and, and wrote down the story with some accuracy. But yeah, I, one of the things that you find about World War II veterans, and especially if they received awards and were heroes, is that they will rarely admit their heroism. They usually tell you, you know, the, yes. the, the brave ones are the ones that didn't come back. And and so, you know, you, you have to wonder if any story of a hero has to be kind of exaggerated in order to make it, you know, you know heroic, especially when you're doing that for national morale and et cetera. So, I mean, I don't think that you could say that America or the West uh, were uh, could not have done something very similar. But it does say a lot about Russia and Russian press uh, and uh, everybody's yeah. opinion there where they were afraid to ever go against the grain and, you know, you could be purged by your side as easily as you could be shot by a German, uh, that, that it could turn out that you would find and perpetuate this myth for, for decades and decades and it could still yeah. threaten your career even so far after it happened, even after the government changed, simply to say the simple truth, to say that, you know, we, it turns out that these guys were not where we, who we said they were or where we said they were. Uh, and yeah, uh, even even if to some extent, I mean, does it matter? No, uh, because because they spiritually uh, represent all those people who fought and yeah. died in the nameless people yeah. who fought and died in the Battle of Moscow. And so their names are actually not that important. But I mean, in the end, yeah. uh, still, we gave names that weren't real names, you know, and yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to, you know, contextualize exactly what that means. Uh, the last thing I want to bring up here is we did. Uh, you were able to connect this with a with a heavy metal band yeah, Sabaton. called Sab Sabaton. Yeah, Sabaton, and you know, I I really appreciate uh, that you know the, these guys really love history and they put a lot of thought into their yeah. songs and their songs are, are representing pieces of history and it was really cool that they wanted to work with us. Uh, we just couldn't figure out how to do that, so we put it up the first time. And we tried to put them in the background. There's a reason we don't put music in the background because it's very difficult to <laughs> to to. I mean, Ken Burns does that a lot, but I mean, that's he's got a yeah. different kind of studio than we have, and he runs at a different kind of pace than we have. Uh, but because uh, his, I mean, his his documentaries tend to go at a very very slow pace where you got a lot of time for music, etc. So anyway, it didn't work. Mm -hmm. People couldn't hear anything, uh, and so I love Sabaton. I think it's really cool that they do what they do and why they do what they do, and that they're you know a heavy metal band that's, that cares about history. Yeah. Uh, and but I mean, it did, didn't work out putting me in the background of the music <laughs> yeah uh, and i you know when they when they ask us about working together i thought like you know you guys make your own video so you don't want my video then to just have your video shoved at the end of it so yeah i wish we could figure out a better way that we could really coordinate with them because i think they're great guys with a great cause and i think it helps yeah. us both being connected uh and and it was cool yeah. that we were both thinking about this at the same time so i i i, I love them uh, i'm a fan buy buy their albums and and maybe we'll figure out a better way to have some sort of co-op between zapaton and the yeah. history guy we we have <laughs> done uh we've done a couple of topics well they they did a, a song about the the night witches yeah. so 
Yeah, it's, a, it's not surprised that we overlap because we, we both love history. Yeah. So uh, yeah, and so I, I that we, it ended up being kind of funny. I mean, you learn things as you make things, and one of them is we kind of we kind of tried something experimental here, and, and we mostly got people going back saying, "What the heck is going on in the middle of this <laughs> video?" Doing? Like, okay, maybe we should just stop in the middle of the video, and done the song, and then moved on. I don't know. I don't know how to, how we. I don't know a better way for us. If you've got a suggestion on a better way to do that, go ahead and send that to the you know to the history. Yeah, that'd be that'd that. be that would be excellent. Yeah, yeah. If we can figure out how we can better cooperate with, but I, I, you know, I think they're great wish them all the luck in the world i'm glad that we were able to work with them and it was you know it was really quite an honor actually that they thought of us because they actually came to us uh, with that idea yeah yeah thank you for listening to this episode of the history guy podcast we hope you enjoyed this episode of forgotten history and if you did you can find more on our website thehistoryguy.com we release podcasts every two weeks, so stick around if you want to hear more podcasts of Forgotten History. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon. You can even get a personalized message from the History Guy himself on Cameo.